Okay, Vern, over to you to do the introduction. Thank you. All right, uh, so uh, welcome to today's RCS seminar. We're very happy to have Nathan from Macquarie University uh, to talk to us about his research. He's currently an associate professor um, from the Department of Earth and Envi Environmental Sciences at Macquarie. And his um, research focuses on metamorphic petrology, where he combines both field and laboratory studies to exam um, to examine metamorphic processes to put constraints on geodynamic and metasomatic processes that involve these metamorphic rocks and to advance our understanding in cluster evolution and geodynamics. And his uh, research addresses multiple scales from zircon crystals all the way to evolution of large origins, which we get to have a sample of both to, in, in his two talks today. So without further ado, uh, let us welcome Nathan. Thank you, Boone, and thank you everyone for having me present today. Welcome to the talks. Uh, today I'm going to discuss a natural case study of mantle-derived melt migration pathways through the lower crust of a magmatic arc environment to start with. This work was done with my collaborator, Sandra Piazzolo, who's at Leeds, and our PhD and master's students. And my future research in this topic is through a currently funded ARC DP with Steve Foley and Heather Handley uh, here at Macquarie. This is a summary of the key findings of our work so far. In order to look for melt migration pathways, we've focused on the microstructural and microchemical fingerprints. These include microstructures indicative of the former presence of melt, such as grain boundary films and low dihedral angles that occur in hydration corona textures. Along with the hydration, we observe rare earth element mobility and metasomatism associated with the melt migration. Our field observations have shown us that sometimes we have a recognizable igneous component in the outcrop, such as leucosome lenses or dikes, and sometimes we don't. Our goal was to enhance our understanding of mass and heat transfer. The natural case study that I present today is from Fiordland in the South Island of New Zealand. In the Cretaceous, greater than 100 million years ago, this was a Cordilleran magmatic arc environment. It's a natural laboratory where we can study melt migration pathways because the deep lower crustal root of a magmatic arc is exposed from 40 kilometers deep. We see little retrograde or deformation overprint and lots of belt flux features and the exposure is excellent. The older exposed magmatic rocks in Fiordland are shown here in red and yellow on the map. The black dots on the strontium versus silica diagram at the bottom are from our study area in the Pembroke granulite, which is shown in yellow on the map. These older rocks show a typical arc flux rate of around 14 cubic kilometers per million years per kilometer of arc addition to the crust. The younger arc batholiths are shown in green and blue. These formed over about a 10 million year period where there was a flare up event. When the flux rate increased to greater than 100 cubic kilometers per million years per kilometer of arc, and our research question was to look for the effect of the open system and reactive melt migration of these high strontium mantle derived melts, shown in green and blue, through the older arc crust, coloured red or yellow on the map. I'll talk about three melt migration events within this natural case study. The first is a diffuse porous flow, where we interpret melt migration along grain boundaries during relatively static or low deformation conditions. The original rock is a 2-pyroxene pargasite amphibole granulite. It shows lots of evidence for solid state deformation in forming the nisosity. Static coronae involving amphibole quartz or amphibole plagioclase around pyroxene grains are variably developed throughout the valley. The top of this slide shows a low development of the amphibole coronae around pyroxenes. And the bottom shows where the pyroxenes are almost completely replaced. The key features of these reaction textures is the hydration to form amphibole, which infers an open system 
and presents the question of what was the source for the water. We mapped a couple of key samples of the Australian synchrotron and focus on strontium in the plagioclase. The two centre diagrams C and D show maps of strontium. Note the strontium scales are slightly different in the two panels. The yellow areas are high strontium. These are interpreted as marking melt migration pathways shown by the red arrows in the bottom diagram. The high strontium melts are interpreted to leave behind a higher strontium imprint on the plagioclase as these melts migrate through the lower crust. The first interpretation of most researchers is that the hydration is driven by influx of aqueous fluid rather than melt. In order to convince the reviewers of our work that melt was involved in this hydration, we firstly took a microstructural approach. We found many microstructures indicative of the former presence of melt. That includes some very small volumes of plagioclase, K-feldspar and quartz that represent crystallization of a former melt pocket. We see evidence for wetted grain boundaries and low dihedral angles. These are less than 60 degrees, and they indicate the likely pseudomorphism of a former grain boundary melt, along with other microstructures that have been uh, presented in past literature as key microstructures indicative of the former presence of melt. We see chemical changes in the major element chemistry of the minerals, but the most convincing evidence for the reviewers of our work was the rare earth element profiles at the bottom of this slide. The new pargasite amphibole in the coronae textures, it's marked by black lines in the graph at the bottom, and it's relatively enriched in rare earth elements compared to the reaction minerals, the reactive minerals, plagioclase, enstatite, and diopside that the amphibole replaces. The middle enriched rare earth pattern is typical of magmatic amphibole. The enrichment and the uniform shape of the rare earth element profiles, regardless of whether the coronate textures replace a diopside or an enstatite, was very convincing for the reviewers of our work that the system was open and that melt must have been the most likely source of water because rare earth elements are much more mobile in melt than they are in aqueous fluids. The key message for this first part of the talk today or well, the first part of this first half of the talk, is that the hydration textures we see in this part of the lower arc crust, they're not related to retrograde reactions. Instead, we interpret these hydration textures as formed during pervasive diffuse porous melt flow of a hydrous gabbroic melt through the lower arc crust. We've recently completed some reaction experiments where we took dry gabbroic rock and we reacted it with a hydrous version of itself in a glass. The melt rock reaction formed coronae of hornblende amphibole around the pyroxenes in very similar texture to what we see in the natural uh, lower crustal arc rocks. These textures developed very rapidly. The experiment was only 12 hours long. The second event of melt flux through the lower arc crust is a brittle event that formed a grid pattern of thin feldspar rich dikelets with adjacent garnet reaction zones. I won't say much about them here in this talk because there's been a lot of published um, on this particular set of rocks. They're quite interesting, but these overprint the diffuse porous melt flow that I've just talked about and they provide excellent strain markers and reaction markers for the subsequent melt flux events that I'll focus on next. In detail, the thin dikes are rich in plagioclase and garnet, and within the host rock, a few centimeter wide garnet reaction zone has developed around the dikes, where that earlier amphibole is dehydrated adjacent to the dikes to form garnet instead. Many of the dikes show very thin septum at the center that we interpret as representing the closure or collapse of a dike after the melt has moved past. Cutting across these key structural and reaction markers are other dikes and in a few slides time I'll show you a ductile shear zones that also cut across these uh, garnet reaction zones and dikes. In this outcrop you can see here 
we have a relatively coarse pegmatitic white dike that's cutting across the garnet reaction zones. Either side of the pegmatitic dike is a hydration reaction zone where the earlier garnet reaction zones are now getting hydrated and the earlier plagioclase rich dikes are converted to thin trains of garnet or garnetite layers. The scale of these hydration features steps up to a meter scale where along some of these secondary thin dikes, we can see this hydration either side of those dikes forming these interesting wing-like patterns that project outwards along those early garnet reaction zones, which probably have a higher reaction affinity being dry with this migrating melt in the new cross-cutting dike. This hydration of the garnet reaction zones, it also occurs in narrow meter scale shear zones. We observe many hydro shear zones in the valley, these sort of meter wide ones, and they cut across this grid pattern of garnet reaction zones. These convert the granulite into amphibolite. We observe no recognizable igneous components in the outcrop. For example, we don't see leucosome or dikes inside these shear zones. We see compositional banding, fabric gradient, change in color, change in grain size, a new foliation lineation, and bending of the older nisosity and garnet reaction zones into the new fabric that all indicate that they're a ductile shear zone. They're just a little bit different than your average one. The largest of these shear zones is 30 to 40 meters wide. And rather than amphibolite, it's dominated by hornblendite. So a lot of the plagioclase has been taken out of this shear zone. Panels B and C and D, they show the progressive replacement of the earlier formed rocks towards the shear zone and into the shear zone in panel D. You can see the grid pattern of garnet reaction zones in panel A gets replaced by garnetite and hornblendite in panel D. Panel E shows that some parts of this shear zone are pegmatitic, where there is coarse amphibole shown by the white arrows, plagioclase by the red arrows, and garnet by the yellow arrows. This indicates a minor igneous component that's recognizable in our crop in this wider shear zone. The geochemical data within this shear zone shows us that there is significant whole rock rare earth element metasomatism. Some parts of this shear zone are hornblendite and some parts of the shear zone are a clinozoazite bearing hornblendite. It's an epidote group mineral and it has up to 20% of this clinozoazite epidote. The rare earth element patterns for these different rock components are distinct compared to the original gabbroic nice host rocks. In thin section, the host has a strong metamorphic character with a nice exfoliation, evidence for crystal plastic deformation, multiple metamorphic events, etc. Intuitively, we expect to see a lot of deformed minerals in thin sections of the high strain hornblendite rocks in the shear zone. But surprisingly, what we actually see is an igneous character to the microstructures. The top panel B shows an example of the garnetite with hornblendite, and the bottom panel shows the clinozoazite rich hornblendite. The backscatter images D, E, and F, they show igneous like microstructures indicative of the former presence of melt in this shear zone. These include interstitial textures, films along grain boundaries, low dihedral angles, and so on. The texture for the hornblendite rocks looks very much like an igneous cumulate, but from the field relationships, we know that these rocks and microstructures formed in a high strain zone. The model we developed involved flux of an externally derived hydrosilicate melt that is in disequilibrium with the arc lower crust that it's migrating through. The melt migration and the melt rock reaction that occurred within this active zone of ductile deformation involved dissolution, a type of grain scale magmatic assimilation of the precursor rock, while the melt also crystallized the horn blend with or without the clinozoazite epidote and garnet. The processes inferred in these pathways of melt migration are geochemically equivalent to AFC. The assimilation 
is happening through this grain scale magmatic dissolution process. And the fractional crystallization of the melt that's moving through occurred by the growth of the new horn blend, clinozoazite and garnet. Therefore, as the melt moves through the lower crust in stage one of the cartoon, it will change its chemistry as it reacts with the lower crust in the shear zones. After the host rock has largely reacted away, we're left with this horn blendite dominated shear zone. And at this point, and after this point, the mantle-derived gabbroic melts are probably able to migrate through the shear zones in a relatively armoured channel and not changing their chemistry significantly. One of the key take-home messages of this natural case study is that when we see ultra-basic brock in the field, these are very common in the lower crust. It doesn't necessarily mean that they form through accumulation of mafic minerals or by intrusion of some sort of uh, basic or ultra-basic magma. These rocks, I think, are in fact a geological expression of localised channels of melt flux through the lower crust. While initially reactive, these channels are sites of geochemical evolution of the migrating melts. And so when we see signatures in our more shallow crustal magmatic and volcanic rocks, the kind of chemical signatures that might indicate amphibole or garnet were crystallising at depth, these may in fact be happening in this sort of reactive flow environment as melt reacts along crustal pathways, compared to, for example, happening in a magma chamber setting as is commonly envisaged. A second take home message is that the high strain zones that we studied here in New Zealand have very different microstructure compared to a classic myelinite, which is shown here in this picture that I've just copied from the web. I won't go through all the features listed, but ask you to contrast this photomicrograph here of a typical myelinite, you know, 500 degrees Celsius myelinite, with a microstructure in the shear zones of our study on the next slide. The microstructure of milk fluxed high strain zones lack the bimodal grain size distribution and most other features common to typical myelinite. I think the characteristic microstructural observations from our study listed here are an excellent indicator for shear zones and sites of former melt flux through the lower crust. So to summarize the field observations of shear zones rich in leucosome lenses and dikes are commonly used to infer melt present deformation and a former melt transfer zone through the crust. However, in our case study of the Fjordland lower arc crust, we found little field evidence along these lines. We therefore had to rely on the microstructures. We found that these are not typical of classic myelinite rocks and include microstructures that are indicative of the former presence of melt. An interesting point is that the observed melt pseudomorphs, they must crystallize at the end of the deformation story in order to be preserved in the rock. This implies that once the melt crystallizes in our shear zones, the shear zone and the rock becomes hard such that those delicate melt pseudomorph microstructures are preserved through to today. Chemically, we observe hydration in the form of amphibol, and we see evidence for rare earth element mobility and metasomatism. One of the questions in terms of future research that I have is how important is reactive migration of melt through the lower arc crust and in other igneous systems informing the geochemical patterns that we observe. So just to note that most of what I've talked about in this first half of today's seminar is largely published. So in the recording or now you can take a quick screen grab of those various papers um, that speak to uh, what I've covered in this talk. I'll just stop sharing that show and share the other talk. And I'll continue to move on. Just write down your questions and we'll catch them all at the end. Okay, that should be projected in the next talk now. So this second talk, it follows on from the first one in that it now examines the effects of full dissolution precipitation. And in particular, I'm gonna talk about melt migration and the effect of melt mediated coupled dissolution precipitation on geochronology. So my main collaborators here are Jackie from the University of Tasmania and Tom from the University of South Australia along with a range of students and postdocs in a number of tectonic settings and locations. Our interest is in the effect of this melt migration that we've been studying in various places on accessory minerals like monazite and zircon 
uh, to test the reliability of current geochronological interpretations, particularly in the case uh, like is shown on the Concordia diagram here on the title slide to the right, where individual spot ages spread over tens or hundreds of millions of years. The first part of the talk will focus on the process of coupled dissolution precipitation in a geological context. So for background for people that aren't too familiar with the process, in the classic experiments by Andrew Putnus, potassium bromide crystals were placed in a chlorine rich fluid. In Penel A, a rim develops that's porous. The porosity provides pathways into the core of the crystal. In Penel B, the crystal has been completely replaced by coupled dissolution precipitation. After 24 hours, the porosity coarsens in Penel C, and by Penel D, the crystal starts to heal after 12 days. Note that with prolonged exposure to the fluid, the porosity that is integral to the coupled dissolution precipitation process can completely heal. And they only found that the reaction, oh, they also found that the reaction rates are very high. The coupled dissolution precipitation process, it's driven by the relative solubility of minerals in the fluid. And so any minerals will dissolve if the fluid is undersaturated with respect to that mineral. This is true of all fluid mediated metamorphism in general. Local saturation in a boundary layer fluid will occur at the interface because the process just dissolves components of the mineral into that boundary layer fluid. This ultra local saturation in the boundary layer fluid then drives precipitation. The reaction migrates inwards into the reactant mineral via porosity. So the fluid can get access to the internal parts of the crystal. So porosity is an integral part of the coupled dissolution precipitation process. The image to the right shows a micro CT scan of one of these porous textures in a mineral. The yellow areas are the porosity that connects the bulk fluid to the reaction interface. And they remind me a little bit of anthills and the structures of anthills. So our research question is whether this process of coupled dissolution precipitation is common in minerals like monazite and zircon that we use for geochronology. We often see complex textures in cathodoluminescence, like is shown on this zircon, with a ghosted rim. Our new interpretation of these rims is that at the interface of the fluid zircon reaction, the dissolution of those zircon components includes uranium and lead isotopic character, such that when the new zircon precipitates in coupled dissolution precipitation, it can inherit or partly copy that uranium lead isotopic character. Although the grain has been recrystallized, there is a question as to whether the age resets to zero. This depends on the connectivity of the fluid at the interface and the bulk fluid that's driving the process. The cartoons on the right are showing that chemical communication happens through microporosity in the recrystallized domain, in the rim. If the connectivity is high, then there is a good chance that lead can escape and we might reset the age of our rim domain to zero. If that connectivity is low, then the likelihood of transporting the old uranium lead isotopic character away from the recrystallizing parts of the grain is less likely. We infer that this process creates complex age patterns like is shown in the upper right. The colored diagrams at the bottom are there to remind me that the prolonged exposure of the fluid the with prolonged exposure, the new recrystallized grain can homogenize its chemistry and it can heal the porosity, essentially covering its tracks. So it's hard to recognize that the process happened. The process of coupled dissolution precipitation, it needs to be contrasted with volume diffusion. This is because researchers who use geochronology, like me, we tend to think about closure temperatures in terms of volume diffusion. And so this happens in the absence of a fluid. It's a, it has high activation energies and therefore happens at high temperatures. The components move by the crystal lattice and there's no destruction of the framework and the rates are actually quite low for most silicates. In contrast with coupled dissolution precipitation, the fluid lowers the activation energies 
Coupled dissolution precipitation, it's very fast. And it involves these three steps of dissolving, transporting over very tiny scales to quite large scales, and then precipitation. The scales of transport are likely important in whether the age of the domain is reset or not. So let's now look at some experiments that we published on this year that were done here at Macquarie University with John Adam and a PhD student, Jan Varga, from the University of South Australia. Previous monazite fluid experiments involved a range of fluids. For water and brines, they found that there was little interaction. However, alkali bearing fluids reacted to produce core rim textures with porosity in the rims. These previous studies documented changes in textures, chemistry, and geochronology. Five of the 17 experiments that have been published were able to reset the age of their monazite with temperatures as low as 450 degrees Celsius. Although in most of the experiments, the modified monazite showed incomplete lead loss patterns, along with incorporation of common lead, like is shown in the figure. These patterns were inferred to be caused by analysis of monazite with unsupported lead or with nanomixtures of the precursor monazite and the new monazite. My key message looking at these experiments is that the monazite that's precipitated during coupled dissolution precipitation, it can record the age of the recrystallization event, or it can record these partially modified inherited ages of the precursor monazite, showing these apparent lead loss trends on a Concordia diagram. Our idea was to do experiments involving monazite and milk. We took two monazite standards from the University of Adelaide, the AMBAT standard, which is around uh, 520 million years old, and the Mount Garnet standard at 320 million years old. In the three-hour experiment, we found that the Mount Garnet monazites partially dissolved into the melt, showing porosity throughout the grain and no chemical changes. In the very right is an AMBAT crystal, which developed a core rim texture during the melt monazite reaction experiment. We interpreted four textural types shown in the upper right. Textural type one is the core of the grain. It represents the original uh, mineral standard that we put in. It then goes through two porous zones, T2 and T3, to a textural type four, which are these relatively inclusion poor rims of the grains. In dating these two different grains, the 520 million year old AMBAT crystals show a range of disturbance along the Concordia and away from the Concordia. The 320 million year old Mount Garnet um, grains also showed lead loss trends. On the very right, you can see that the coupled dissolution precipitation process in the AMBAT crystal is driving significant chemical changes where the recrystallized or the precipitated domains in the rims these have very different chemistry to the precursor crystal, even though the ages are largely inherited. Allowing that experiment to continue to 24 hours, we found that the Mount Garnet standard dissolved completely. The core rim textures were better developed now in the AMBAC grains, where the rim domains were largely, um, where, sorry, where the porosity was larger in those rim domains. Um, and possibly some overgrowth formed through the dissolution of the Mount Garnet standard and migration of that dissolved material to form overgrowths on the AMBAC cores. After 24 hours, a significant proportion of those T4 rim domains have relatively reset ages. They're not perfectly reset to zero, but quite close to zero, and certainly on a trend that's heading towards zero with an intercept of two million years old. The problem with those grains is that they didn't reset neatly to zero. They still have some history of that precursor uranium lead isotopic story in them or in the ablation volume. The analyses of the other domains, T1 to T3, they spread out along Concordia over two or 300 million years. This pattern formed in a day and those ages are not really geologically significant individually. To compare the experiments, here is data from a natural schist sample from Central Australia. The precursor rock looks like it's something in the range of 1660 million years old. Some monazite grains, the data from them spread along a discord line 
But the most problematic part of this data is the mess of young analyses that spread over a couple of hundred million years. What do these mean? The BSC images at the top show the complexity in internal structure. The microstructure gives me little doubt that coupled dissolution precipitation played a role. And I think the geochronology is almost useless at that young end. So what else have people interpreted in natural rocks? We can find lots of examples of complex textures that are interpreted to be indicative of coupled dissolution precipitation. Their uranium lead data is also complex. And so how we treat that data and how we interpret the geological significance of the data is quite fundamental. Everyone, including me um, up until now, has assumed or interpreted that the ages we were getting were nearly always geologically meaningful, or most of the time they were geologically meaningful. So to run through a few quick examples from the literature, here's a low temperature example from WA, where the rims are uniformly 1.2 GA, and it appears that in this case study, they were reset during the low temperature metamorphism. In this interesting paper from 2012, they looked at pegmatitic monazite in three different locations. They dated the samples with electron microprobe chemical dating and found the secondary monazite was generally younger than the primary monazite, which is a good start, but not with a very tidy age range. In the middle sample, they found that the age of the secondary monazite was actually older than the precursor monazite, uh, which is an obvious problem. The same samples were also dated by laser ablation methods. And we can see some of the same patterns that we saw in our experiments, incorporation of common lead, some evidence of lead loss, uh, but also some evidence of lead gain in the middle sample. I'll move quickly through the next few examples in the story as the story is pretty much the same. Uh, a spread of near concordant ages is interpreted as long lived metamorphism that lasted for tens to a few hundred million years. Note in this example from East Antarctica, the porosity in some of the monazite grains and those inward penetrating lobate rims shown in the chemical map that are suggestive of coupled dissolution precipitation. In the Musgrave inlier, long-lived metamorphism lasting more than 70 million years. Again, note the porous monazite in the picture. In Madagascar, long-lived metamorphism lasting 80 million years, here recorded in both monazite on this slide and zircon on this slide. Note the mess at the lower intercept of the Concordia diagram for the zircon data. In Sri Lanka, long-lived metamorphism lasting more than 100 million years based on a compilation of more than a thousand analyses. My key message today is that these complex patterns can form in hours in our experiments. And so is it true that these age patterns in natural rocks really take tens or hundreds of millions of years to develop during long-lived metamorphism. Stepping to zircon and the research we've done in the past on the Mawson Charnakite in Antarctica, I showed the complex textures on the left early in the talk and the spread of zircon ages along Concordia over a couple of hundred million years, between 690 and 1048 MA. Our interpretation when we published it back in 2012 was that around 1050 was probably the emplacement age for the Charnakite, or at least the minimum emplacement age. And everything else in the age pattern was some sort of mysterious lead loss event that we really couldn't get a handle on at the time. In 2012, we argued against complete recrystallization, as this, in brackets, coupled dissolution precipitation, it should expel lead and completely reset the uranium lead age and remove all trace of primary zoning. I think back then we got it wrong. I think this process of coupled dissolution precipitation, it can form such an ultra local chemical environment at the dissolution precipitation reaction front that the uranium lead character of the precursor grain can get copied or at least partly copied to form these complex spreads in ages. So today I would interpret that most grains are xenocris in the charnakite. These have been variably affected by coupled dissolution precipitation. In the backscatter electron image, which was collected just in the last few months, we found evidence for microporosity in the zircons. The key message here is that zircon, which has been affected by coupled dissolution precipitation, doesn't necessarily faithfully record an accurate age of the recrystallization event. In the case of the Morton Charnakite, I now say it's probably a Pan-African aged intrusion 
This made me go back and look at some other work that I had done previously. This example from Fjordland in New Zealand, uh, Luke Milan and I went back recently and looked at some of his backscatter images of his zircon grains. And you can see here that there is abundant evidence for microporosity, which I think is the hallmark of coupled dissolution precipitation having affected these zircon grains. I now question the age spread over 10 or 15 million years that we saw in all 16 of his samples. It possibly represents the CDP process rather than anything significant about the geological timescales. Now, this one's not my work, but it highlights an excellent example of coupled dissolution precipitation in zircon, but where the ages of the two domains are the same. So does this mean that the two events were very closely spaced in time, or is zircon 2 inheriting the age pattern of zircon 1 during a much younger event? Another quick example from zircon in oceanic gabbros. Here, 19 samples have simple internal zoning patterns in their zircons, and they're 12.76 million years old. One sample out of 20 showed evidence of CDP, and it's 760,000 years younger. As 12 MA matched the magmatic, or sorry, the magnetic age on the sea floor in this area, the one sample beat out the other 19 in the interpretation. In Hadean zircons, where very detailed chemical mapping of lead 207 shows that it forms clusters and variation across the grain scale. Integration of the data marked by the ellipses on the lead map show a vast spread of ages on the Concordia diagram that spread over a few hundred million years. I believe these complexities in detailed chemistry of the grain are formed through coupled dissolution precipitation and migration of the chemical components into different domains of the grain during that process. So now we're starting to step away from convention. In a paper we published this year, we're putting out our new interpretation for these sort of textures, <coughs> sorry, where for magmas that are undersaturated with respect to zirconium, these are going to be dominated by xenocrystic zircon cargo. They're not going to have enough zirconium to precipitate new zircon, and the modification of the zircon xenocryst by coupled dissolution precipitation will modify the ages towards the true magmatic age. In the cartoon on the right, we've tried to show the process of progressive replacement that ends up producing quite complex zircon internal textures that, in, that, include, um, that include inclusion rich areas as seen in the backscatter and the CL images. So our final message is to ask, when should we worry about this process being a problem for our geochronology? It's when we see microstructures that are indicative of former coupled dissolution precipitation. We might see core rim textures with or without the inclusions that are inferred to have pseudomorphed to fluid filled porosity. We might see microporosity and inward penetrating curved boundaries between core and rim domains. We need to be particularly wary that it is possible in cryptic cases that this whole grain can get replaced by coupled dissolution precipitation. And this can leave a relatively homogeneous texture with a complex age pattern. Again, this work has been published for the monazites and for that zircon interpretation in an example from Antarctica. Thank you, I'll open it up for questions for both the talks. Thank you, so any questions, uh, please raise hands using the participants uh, raise hand button or um, type something into the chat box. Let's see how we go. Hmm. Have you started looking at the inclusions, Nathan? Yeah, so the, there are two things we've started to do. One is to try to characterise the 3D structure of the inclusions. And so we're trying to do some micro CT and nano CT on some separated zircon grains from the Chanakites in Antarctica. Um, mm -hmm. The preliminary stuff wasn't quite high enough resolution, so we're trying to step to a better instrument at another university. Uh, but what we find is that the inclusions, although in the section they look like a you know, relatively round um, inclusion, 
in three dimensions, they're more worm-like or tunnel-like shapes. And so the dissolution process seems to produce these um, tunnel-like features through the grains that then, as the system cools down, I guess the melt is able to then precipitate some minerals. Hmm. Interesting. And so, yeah, we, we did characterise the various minerals. They're, they're similar to what you see as the main other silicate phases in the host rock. So over to Charnakite, we see bits of orthopyroxene, bits of biotite, plagioclase, K-feldspar quartz as inclusions in the zircons. Tim? Thanks. I'm just thinking about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's a question in the chat from Michael. Um, can I just read out in your GABRO experiments, what was the composition of your GABRO and based on plutonic, plutonic GABRO compositions or adjusted to represent the liquid that would have crystallized the plutonic assemblage? So in the GABRO experiments, um, we're back in the first talk, we took a natural uh, Gabaric sample from Fjordland, uh, from a place called Lake Grave. We used that as the natural rock fragments in the experiment for half the capsule. And the other half of the capsule was that exact same rock powdered up and turned into a glass with water, water added to it. And so it was basically a, the only difference between the two halves of the capsule was that it was a hydrous version of Gabbro reacting with a solid Gabbro mineral assemblage. And so this was a 53, 54% silica sample from New Zealand. Very average um, of the crust there. Thank you. Anybody else uh, like to ask a question? I'll follow on a little bit from um, Penny's question while I'm thinking of it is that we've also just started doing some zircon melt reaction experiments similar to the monazite ones. And those experiments, to my surprise, have been very successful in producing uh, porosity and micro channels of dissolution running through the zircon grains and modifying the uh, seal textures and modifying the microprobe chemistry of the grains. Our next steps will be to characterize them with uh, more laser based methods to look at how it affects the geochronology and how it affects the trace element signatures. So that's quite exciting work that's happening with one of our students at the moment. So, so based on those experiments, do you think it's the, um, that you're just dissolving the local uh, accessory phase, creating a local enrichment in those components and pulling it back? But in that case, why is there the microporosity? So the, the microporosity is critical to keep the bulk fluid or melt in our experiments connected to the internal parts of the grain, which are the most out of equilibrium. And so as it reacts, it needs to dissolve, but it needs to yeah. keep this porous network to allow the fluid to keep getting further into the crystal to keep the process going. And so if precipitation outcompetes the dissolution, then you'll clog up that porosity and you'll just have a rim develop. If the dissolution is able to be slightly more competitive than the precipitation, then you can keep going further and further into the crystal to keep reacting away the former crystal and replacing it with the new crystal. Now, in the case of the monazite and the zircon, we're specifically trying to get older monazite replaced by new monazite or older zircon replaced by new zircon. But in lots of experiments people do, you get new minerals, new metamorphic minerals replacing other minerals. Did yeah, I guess I'm just trying to think about it too in terms of the volume change. Do you think there's much of a volume change in that space? So if we're replacing zircon for zircon, then the volume change shouldn't be so significant. We've obviously got to take away a little bit of volume. Inclusions, so that's the thing that's... <laughs> so the inclusions to my mind are just where you've got a melt field porosity and that crystallizes at the end of the story and you grow some minerals. And so they're not included in the sense of at the time the zircon grew, they're like I a pseudo inclusion that's forming during the CDP process at a much younger time. Okay, yeah, okay, I get it, thanks. That's okay. All right, well, Nathan, we've, we've had all the questions so far. Um, what I might do then is, uh, before people start leaving, is to just say thank you once again from 
uh, everyone here for giving your time to, to present at the seminar. Um, I'm going to stop the recording at this point. So thank you very much. And there are multiple, multiple clap symbols. So thank you.